Thank you for joining me today for the Sunday School lesson. I'm going to take a little more time talking about the faithfulness of God than I will in getting to other subjects. The whole theme of this 11th chapter is the unfailing love of God to our lives. God's love is so rich and so real. Now, I'm going to read the entire chapter, which is only 12 verses, so that we'll have that single section as the theme of what we're studying today, the primary theme of what we'll be studying today. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. As they called him, they went from them They sacrificed unto Balaam, burned incense to graven images. I taught Ephraim also to go, taking them by their arms, but they knew not that I healed them. I drew them with cords of a man, with bands of love. I was to them as they take the yoke on their jaws, and I laid meat unto them. He shall not return unto the land of Egypt, and the Assyrian shall be his king, because they refused to return. The sword shall abide on his cities, shall consume his branches and devour them, because of their own counsels. And my people are bent to backsliding from me, though they call him to the Most High, none of all would exalt him. How shall I give thee up, Ephraim? How shall I deliver thee, Israel? How shall I make thee as Edmah? How shall I set thee as Zomle, Zebim? Mine heart is turned within me. My repentings are kindled together. I will not execute. Now notice the language. I will not execute the fierceness of my wrath. I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in the midst of thee, and I will not enter into the city. They shall walk after the Lord. He shall roar as a lion. When he shall roar, then the children shall tremble from the west. They shall tremble as a bird, out of Egypt, and as a dove out of the land of Assyria. I will place them in their houses, saith the Lord. Ephraim compassed me about with lies, the house of Israel with deceit. But Judah yet ruleth with God, and is faithful with the saints. Now, I'm going to take this in just some order as it comes, this idea of providing some, let's use the word theological, some biblical interpretation of the history of Israel, pointing out how they had failed as a nation. But in spite of the failure, the mainstay of God's love, a loving father provides for all of your needs. Let me say that again. A loving father provides for all of your needs. Now let me just inject here. Some people say, my dad never told me he loved me. Now that was not my case. But if my dad had never told me he loved me, I knew he loved me by what he did. You see, my dad got up many, many days of his life as a coal miner. He got up before the sun was up, and he got out of the coal mines after the sun had gone down. There were days he did not see daylight for any length of time. Under the ground with pick and shovel, picking out coal 
loading in a coal car, taking it to the temple, dumping the car into the temple, loading the train that would be carrying the coal to some other place in the world. My dad didn't have to tell me he loved me. I knew he loved me, or he would never have spent time day after day making provision for his family. My dad got hurt in the coal mines, thought he was going to die. We all believed that he would never make it. But he did walk with a limp the rest of his life. We finally was able to go back to coal mining and died in the coal mines of a heart attack. My dad didn't have to tell me he loved me. I knew he loved me by what he did. That's what God is saying to Israel. You should know how much I love you because of what I've done for you. Does that make sense? It does to me. My children should say to me as their father, I love you because there's never been a time I was hungry. There's never been a time I didn't have a roof over my head. There has never been a time when I didn't look as well-dressed as I could possibly be. There's never been a time that you did not see to my education. I shouldn't have to tell them. They know by what I've done. A good father makes provision for his children. God loves Israel, makes provision for all of their needs. As a son, this attitude, this act, both are important, but the latter is more important. You don't have to tell me as much as you need to show me that you love me. Israel was called out of Egypt. Do you remember that story? God had planted Joseph in Egypt, and Joseph had gone through all of the rigors of prison over a long period of time. When God finally said, it's time for my nation to come out of Egypt, I've already planted someone there who could be the leader of that nation. Sure enough, through providential acts of God, Joseph became the second in command to all of Egypt. Can you imagine a Hebrew boy going down, getting in trouble, going to prison because of a lie, going to prison, spending all this time in prison, God preparing him to be ready for when he's going to become the second in command of all of Egypt. God making that provision. And finally the time came, the contest between Moses and Pharaoh, because there was a generation that did not know what Joseph had done out of his love for his people, did not understand what God had done. And Moses in this contest, finally, the contest ended with the birth of the con- idea of taking the first child, the death of the first child. And he said to the nation of Israel, now before the angel of death comes through, before the angel of death comes through Egypt, devouring the first child, You take the blood of a lamb, put it on the post and the lintel of the door, and when the angel of death sees the blood, he will pass over you. Only, not because you're a Jew, but because my blood is going to be shed. And this is a forewarning, a foreordination of the fact that the Passover is going to come in your life as well. So the great Passover was formed. The nation of Israel came out of bondage on their way to the promised land. And for 40 years, they wandered because they would not follow God's man. They would not follow the will of God for their life. They had all they needed to eat, and yet they wanted more. They got more. You remember the story of how God fed them with the manna 
from heaven. And then they said, but we need some meat. And so God let all the birds fly in and die and fall right around the camp. All they had to do was pluck it and cook it. God made provision for his people. And even that was not enough. Even that was not enough. So God says to the nation of Israel, I love you. I've called you out of Egypt. They finally made it to the promised land. God made provision for them. The second thing, God's love should be stronger than our disappointments. God's love should be stronger than our disappointments. When divine love is rejected, Israel's response became a means of disappointment. God called afresh to every new age what had happened in Egypt. Called afresh to every new age what had happened in their downturn. The golden calf that they made while he was up receiving the commandments from God. So as a result of all of that, and by the way, that should be with us too. Uh, there were times I was disappointed in my parents, but my disappointment was not as strong as their love. And my love for them was stronger than any disappointment I ever had. I, I just don't know how you write off parents who love you. God's love was stronger than disappointments. Number three, he lovingly taught them how to walk. If you've ever had children and teaching them how to walk is no small thing. Until a child learns to walk, he's totally dependent on you. He can't get up and go get what he needs or even what he thinks, or what he wants. He can't get up. He can't do that. Most animals, I've pastored twice in dairy farming communities. I've watched them pull calves. I've seen calves born. And as soon as they're born, they're able to get up. All you have to do is help them get on their feet, and they're able to walk. It takes a child almost a year to learn to walk and to get around the way he needs to and to move from place to place to get what he needs. So God's love, God's love taught them how to walk. The tender, loving picture of analogy. I did it for you. I taught you how to walk. He upheld them with his arms. Even when they stumbled, he picked them up and loved them. How many times have you kissed a boo-boo? How many times has a mother's kiss healed a knot that was knocked on your head? How many times has a mother's love or a father's love overcome the hurt, maybe the embarrassment that you felt? How many times? So God lovingly, he heals them. Yet, was I who taught my little son to take the first steps. If he fell and hurt his knees, it was I, his father, who kissed and made him better. So writes one writer. God love provided guidance for his people. He desired for them to be in useful service to him. He led them not with truff, not with the ropes. He led them with tender love, ropes of love. God's love made the oak easier and provided the needed food. In love, the metaphor changes all of that because we make the provision, the parent-child analogy. The second thing, a loving father not only let me go back and be sure I'm saying exactly what I want to say. A loving father provides for all of your needs. All of your needs. A loving father admi administers discipline. 
You go through this with every child because you cannot discipline every child the same. What works for one will not work for another. Now, if you have more than one child, you'll know what I'm saying. Some children are just born to be managed easier than other children. Some children are high strung. They're, they're difficult to manage. And you can't manage them the same way that you manage the one who is not high strung, who is cooperative, who is cooperative. And again, let me just use my three children. I have a son, two daughters. John always wanted to be as independent as he could. He always wanted to be, I knew he was going to be an administrator when he grew up. You would go to my son's closet when he was preteen in particular. All of his shirts were hanging in one place, color coordinated. All of his trousers in one place, color coordinated. Always look into the drawer, his socks folded neatly, all of the other things folded neatly. And you go into our baby daughter's room, look in the closet. Nothing is even hanging on racks most of the time. She was the messiest child that I could ever imagine. She hated making beds. And, and even though we saw to it, that she had to do certain things. She never did like doing them. Now, how are you going to manage those two? Our middle child, right in between, was the easiest of the three to manage because she always wanted to please her mother and father. So here are two on the opposite ends how are you going? You do not discipline them the same way. Now that's what God's saying to Israel. I am responsible for administering discipline. I am responsible for your not returning to Egypt. I could have taken my hand off of you and you would have had to go back or die in the desert. One of the two. I'm responsible for placing the discipline of the Assyrians, using another nation to teach you discipline, I am responsible. I am responsible for bringing judgment. I am responsible in administering that as a discipline. It calls your tendency was to backslide. And that's the tendency of all of us is to backslide. We have to be awfully careful. The world makes things so enticing. Watch television just for three hours. I guarantee you everything that is wrong that needs to be sold, they will do it with the finest looking young people that you could find. Always. The party's better but look around the party. Who's having the party? The finest looking young people. They're selling the product. And the world knows how to sell products. Whatever it might be. Any kind of booze. I saw one the other day of a young man. The best he could do for his mother was to take a pint of liquor and have a drink with her. And they sold that as a loving act, or tried to sell it, and some, I'm sure, bought it as a loving act. Listen, folks, we don't need to get caught up in backsliding, walking away from what we know to be right, walking away from what we know is for our best good. We can't afford that in this day and time, backsliding. 
the wrong use of the source of assistance, the wrong use. As one man told me one time, this is, this is an illustration, but it's real. It happened to me. I had a friend who was older than me that I thought at one time may be a mentor for my life. He walked off and left his family for his secretary and then tried to sell me on the idea it was the will of God. No, it, not the will of God. Never. That is a misuse of God's name. That is a misuse of the resource God had given him to know better. That's what he's saying about Israel. You knew better and you did it anyhow. And you thought somehow I'm doing this for God. Somehow using these resources that I made available to you, you used them for the wrong things and thought you were doing them for me or making yourself believe you were doing for me. God has to minister. Discipline. He has to. Next, a loving father can suffer rejection and renewal and still remain faithful. I mean reversal and still remain faithful. There's no giving up. There's no surrender. You simply know that God is going to take care of you eventually. There can be no total utter destruction that will come upon you. God's going to take care of you ultimately. Here's the great heart struggle and anguish. Human sin and divine love. Wrath will be tempered with mercy by God himself because he is God. He, had, he says, I'm God, not man. I'm the Holy One. I am the otherness of life. I am constantly and sure and steadfastly in love with you. Someone said, Martin Luther said at one time, if I were God, I would kick the world to pieces. He's not God. And he can't kick the world to pieces. God wants us to understand he is God, not man. And he's not going to respond like man. He's going to respond like a loving father and provides a way to return every time. As a lion, he roars, his children come. Come like sparrows and doves from all directions, they come. God's love is faithful, even though Israel is unfaithful. And he was watching all of this and was trying to tell the people, Hosea was watching all of this and trying to tell the people what was going on. Now, that's chapter 11. It has to do with the steadfast love of God as our Father. Now he's going to come back and talk about some things that we will see as a national origin and lessons about that origin, the growing wealth that came to Israel as a result of God's blessing upon their life and how they misused that and turned that in the wrong way. We'll see that in our next lesson. The prophet laments his own situation and what has been taking place in his life. Uh, Gomer, his wife, he bought back, you remember from earlier lessons, he bought back off the slave auction block. And uh, the language tends to tell us he had to give up just about everything he owned in order to have enough to buy her back. 
I've often wondered from the time they left the auction block till the time they got back home, how many times Gomer must have asked Hosea, why did you do this? Why did you come and buy me? And the only answer he had, I love you. Israel must have asked, why did you bring me back? Show me a way to come back. God's only answer, because I love you. We'll see something more about that next time. God bless you.